Good morning. I'd like to focus on, well, two announcements basically here in the bulletin on page, at the bottom of page eight, or towards the bottom of page eight, is that the month of September is designated as National Recovery Month. I think this is important to all of us, the number of families impacted by addiction in one form or another. And this depends on whose statistics you read and believe. Uh, but I think we can say somewhat safely, four out of five families are directly impacted by addiction. Alcohol addiction is still our biggest problem. Am I correct on that, Linda? And, and can we say far and away our biggest problem yet? Yes, despite all the news on the other addictions out there. And I think in some way or another, we are all impacted by it. So uh, in our efforts to help those who are in recovery, we are having hope in the bag. And the announcement is here on page 8. And then at the top of page 9 is on the... Coming up on the 21st is our practice of prayer as a way of learning to be silent and expectant before God. If you would turn to the back page of the bulletin, this is page 12. Some of us have to count. <laughs> it's part of my psyche. <laughs> when I see numbers, I count. So, but on page 12... Um, our Sunday evening Bible study will resume next week as we celebrate Labor Day this month. The office is closed tomorrow. We'll open on Tuesday. You can always get a hold of me. And uh, also remember that the Board of Deacons, which would normally meet tomorrow evening, will not meet until the 11th at 7 o'clock. Tuesday, we do have the 10 o'clock ladies Bible study and our evening Bible study here. And Wednesday at 7, Mission and Stewardship meets. And so now, if you will turn to the call to worship on page 3. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us worship God. For you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Grant, O merciful God, that your church being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may sh show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you are able and comfortable, please stand and we will sing together. In Christ, there is no east or west.
proof of God's amazing love is that God loves us just as we are from the beginning of our lives to the end of our lives. He loves us while we rebel against him. The Bible has it as while we were sinners. But while we even rebel against God in the dailiness of our life, God continues God's love for us. He died for us. He rose for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God. This holy, seemingly unapproachable God becomes very personal and real to us and present. And we can stand or at times sit or simply just be before this God. So let's just do that now in silence for a few moments. And now if you would turn to the prayer of confession on page three, we will confess our sin together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And now hear these words. These words which are good news to us that... Christ Jesus came into the world to save you and I, to save humanity, as it were. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin, but alive to this new life that we are given in Christ, alive in ways we could never have imagined, knowing that sin is forgiven in this remarkable new life is in us. So I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. seated. Now let us pray. Holy God, creator and father of us all, you speak to us from the Bible, from your word, from scripture, giving us your message in Jesus Christ that we might hear. So we ask that today we truly hear in the words, the word that you give us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
We have today Old Testament reading from Isaiah, a gospel reading from Mark, a response in the Psalms, and then a New Testament reading from Galatians. So please listen as Bob reads. Good morning. Beginning with two readings from the Old Testament book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 13 and 14, and from chapter 53, verses 5, 10, and 11. Listen for the word of God. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his, in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 32, 34, and verse 45. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him, and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. Now please join me in reading responsibly from Psalm 26, as printed in your bulletin. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I hate the assembly of evildoer, evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. A last reading from the New Testament book of Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galilee. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God, our God and Father. Here in the readings, thanks be to God. Going to spend a little time this morning giving us some background on the New Testament church, a minute or so on each of these, on the Galatian church, and then I'm going to begin to get into the letter itself. I think it's important to have a, at least a sense of context when we come to scripture. It makes a lot of difference whether we're reading something 2,000 years before Christ or 
a thousand years before Christ or seven or eight hundred as Isaiah who seems to very powerfully anticipate the crucifixion uh, or whether we're reading in New Testament times or whether we're reading in modern times uh, context has a lot to say about the truth of the message so to speak so to begin uh, Jesus' death was in a about. And the, the reason I always say about on dates is there is very seldom in ancient literature a definite time frame. Once in a great while there has been an eclipse or something like that that we can tie it to. But beyond that, it's more like in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Well, that went from here to here. <laughs> but we do know when Passovers were because the Jewish nation has kept very precise records. And the two that fit the time of Jesus' death are about 30 or 33. Which means, because we got the calendar wrong in the Middle Ages, <laughs> see how complex this starts to get when you, when you try to tie things down. And also, my fascination with numbers. This, this means that Jesus was about 36 to 39 when he was crucified, Some, somewhere in that time period. An old man for the time. Uh, life expectancy for males then was 22. So, uh, okay. So that, that, that gives us the beginning of when this could have happened. The Gospels began to be passed on by word of mouth. And again, we cannot say that we have a Roman author who wrote down that Mark wrote the gospel in. So we have to guess a little bit. But what, and this is a majority opinion, okay? See, uh, we think that there was oral tradition. We think that behind Matthew is a Hebrew gospel that was written fairly early. We just don't have any copies of it. Uh, Mark wrote the first gospel in Greek. And then the gospel of Matthew followed. I know it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but as far as we know, Mark wrote first, then Matthew, then Luke, and then John. From about 60 to 90. So, so we have the gospels here. The letters of Paul may have been written as early as 45, within 10 years of Jesus' death. And we also, and I think there's excellent scholarship behind this, know that some of Paul's sayings, as he says, I hand on to you that which I first received, were in place as early as six months after Jesus' death. So we, we can trace most of these words back very, very early and we also have scraps of letters written by men who studied under the or were students of the apostles. So we have very, very early tradition. So when you go out on YouTube and they tell you that the Gospels weren't in place until 8300, there's a couple words you could use for that. I won't repeat them. Okay. Uh, there's, there's very careful scholarship that comes out of our, as we say, this D1 universities that we can trace these back and we have scraps of letters there's a scrap of one of the gospels in the Rylands uh, museum slash library at Oxford that may even go back into the 40s we would call it a proto gospel a first gospel uh, the writing on it is certainly that old so that gives us a, puts the letters in place 45 to 50 probably Galatians or first Thessalonians was the first of them as far as we know, the churches were small, probably tiny. Uh, persecution broke out pretty early, certainly by the time of Nero in the 60s and was severe in the times of Tatian in the 90s. Uh, they met in homes, they were persecuted, they often put guards at the door. Aren't there stories about guards at our doors against the Indians? What's that?
Okay, so what, what Valerie said is downstairs in the dungeon today, people stood with guns to protect the people worshiping. Not that far away from it, are we? If you lived in China, you would not be at all far from it. And several dozen other countries where Christians are persecuted, often jailed, and uh, often martyred. It, it's, it's happening today. So, the early church believed that salvation was by faith through grace. Period. Okay. They did not have the 350,000 volumes of theology that are down here in PTS library. The early Christians did not even have the Gospels yet. They had the Old Testament, and that's where all the sermons began. So, okay, that's, that's kind of the background of the early church. Small, tiny family churches who have received the Gospel that you are saved by grace through faith. And that was pretty much it. The Galatian church to whom Paul writes, actually churches, there were, he uses a plural. And again, history is speculative, but was probably to persons of the Celtic nation who had moved from France into northern Turkey. Uh, they had been Romanized, that is, they were under Roman control. And at some point, Paul has preached this simple gospel to them. Now, after Paul leaves the churches of Galatia, another group of teachers have come in and said, what Paul taught you is not sufficient. You have to follow the Jewish law, and you have to be circumcised. And that did not go well. <laughs> and it certainly did not go well with Paul. As the letter proceeds and we work through it, we'll see that he is not only amazed, one of the words he uses, but he is angry. Uh, and the Galatians are confused. What is the true gospel? And I think one of the primary reasons to preach through this today is that we are still confused about what is the true gospel. I just read a list of what is Christianity. There were 11 facets of it, and not a single one of them had to do with Jesus Christ. Welcome to modern scholarship. <laughs> okay. This letter has transformed the world. It is a letter that worked on Martin Luther until he began the Protestant Reformation. It is the letter that transformed Charles and John Wesley and began the Methodist Church in some of the greatest preaching that ever existed. It was dictated by Paul and sent by a messenger to be read to these churches. And as I noted, I said Paul was angry. Paul's not just angry, Paul is livid. Paul is sputtering with rage as he writes this letter. And so you know he's not angry at the Galatians. Okay. But he begins his letter as any ancient letter writer would. He says, Paul. He identifies himself. And then he goes on and he says, an apostle not sent from human beings or a human church, but actually sent by Jesus Christ. He is very adamant that this is not his language, not his work, not his concept, not his teaching. What he taught the Galatians came certainly to him, but it came directly from Jesus Christ. Paul had had a re set of more remarkable experiences of the risen Christ. For Paul, Christ is just as alive as anyone sitting here. And he intimates that he had three years of teaching by Christ in other parts of the letter. So this is not something that he dreamed up. It's not something he got from the philosophers, which he quotes freely. I think 22 Greek philosophers are quoted in his works. 
But this message of the gospel that he gave the Galatians is 100% from Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has sent him to the Galatians with this message. This is what he has done and what they have heard. So he writes to the churches of Galatia. And I said Paul was angry, he was livid, he was full of rage. But did you note how he starts his letter? After he identifies himself, he says, grace to you and peace. Despite all this, shall we say, human emotion, grace to you and peace. He begins as we all should at our best with grace and with peace. Yes, he will in time correct their error as we should but first of all he wants these people to know that they are loved. He wants them to know that he cares for them deeply and that what is caused his anger is that they are being harmed by the teaching they have received. Grace to you in peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And now he gets into his message. He says three things. Having noted that this is from Jesus Christ, he says, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. And we could spend hours on these. And somebody out there said, I hope not. <laughs> we need a break every once in a while. It's just the way we are. Actually, every eight to nine minutes, we need a break. That lets our brain reset, and then we can dig into this next section. So I want to look at each of these three things. How that he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God the Father. Uh, he gave himself for our sins. That he gave himself tells us that this is a free act on his part. Once again, if you go out on the internet, uh, YouTube, uh, I haven't seen it on Reddit yet, but certainly on YouTube you'll find all kinds of work that God is a horrible monster who is a child abuser who on and on and on and on it goes. But this tells us that Jesus freely gave himself. And other parts of our theology tell us that this is something that God, Father, and Son, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had planned from eternity for us. But here he focuses on the free act. So that's the first point. And that he gave himself for our sins. And I want to take a moment or two here to differentiate between sins and sins because that will make his second statement make sense to us, I hope. Sins are those small or large acts in which we disobey God. Sins are those small or large acts in which we do those things which harm ourselves or another person. We tend to categorize them as lying and cheating and stealing, but they can be much broader than that. They can be selfishness. They can be all those things we do for ourselves only at the expense of other people. That was how Bonhoeffer got at sin. <clears throat> it can be lust. It can be pride, misplaced. There are all sorts of things that we do that isolate us from God and isolate us from the goodness of God that as an individual act are a sin. Okay? Sins are individual acts that a person performs. 
that are violent, that are dangerous, that are evil, that are bad, that are dirty, that are so on, so on, so on, so on. Okay. They would have to do, <clears throat> and this is where the false teachers coming in play on, breaking the Ten Commandments or the other 613 laws. Have you eaten pork lately or shrimp or worn clothing with, that say was cotton and linen or wool and linen or rayon? Too bad. <laughs> That's what these people are saying. Uh, sin. In Paul's thought and in biblical thought, sin is an evil power that will do everything that it can to make us commit sins. Okay. I hope that differentiation is not too subtle. There is an evil power, actually in Paul's thought, a set of powers, but we tend to personify this as Satan or sin that causes us to commit sins. Might say this one more time because the distinction is, is, is serious and the whole argument Paul makes here tends or fo forms on, focuses on this. Uh, sin, we might just say, is evil. And it is a force within every person in fact, in the whole universe of Paul's thought, he uses the word cosmos that causes the evil actions of humanity. We might also add to that a lot of the illness of the wars, the, the, the whole mess of evil that's out there. It's a result of sin. So now when we come to this second point, Jesus Christ also, point two, gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age which is under the influence of sin. Okay. See what he's doing here? Jesus Christ's death not only provides forgiveness of sins, but it also frees us from the power of sin. See, when I say this in my mind, I do sins with a little s and sin with capital S, capital I, capital N. That's what's going on in my mind. So it helps me to differentiate here. So Jesus died so that sin, big S, will no longer have power over us. And now we can begin to live the life that God intended us to live from the very beginning when he produced for us this remarkable garden in which we were free, in which we were fed and clothed and happy. Great image. It's the image in Revelation too, by the way. Uh, it's not that we are freed to do anything we want, but we are free so that we no longer do anything which damages us or another person, or breaks our relationship with God. So there's a great deal more going on at the cross than perhaps we realized. Sin itself is conquered as is death. So we as Christians, by grace through faith, are no longer under the power of these evil forces, or force if you like, but are freed from it. And this is according to the will of God. I think so often we forget that God's original intention, God's current intention and fewer intention is that we live full, thriving, healthy, happy, joyous lives. And that the whole story of the Bible lays in all its complexity and all its challenges to us, lays that out from beginning to end. 
God's intention throughout the entire Old Testament is a word called shalom, which basically is full human thriving past what we can imagine. The message in the New Testament is that we have been freed from sin or evil so that we can enjoy this life. And that's what Paul is saying. In Jesus Christ, you have been freed for this life which God intended for you from the very beginning. And what has happened, and this this plays out through the whole letter, is that there are teachers who have come in and said, grace is not enough. You have to follow the law and all that comes from the law. And this is why Paul is so livid, because it binds these people back to the law. And you might think, well, what is so dangerous about that? But what is dangerous about that is it takes salvation out of God's hands and puts it into ours. If I do these things, then I'll be saved. And Paul is saying, no, you don't have to do a darn thing. Almost slipped up. (laughs) You don't have to do anything because Jesus has done it all. Period. And that's why it's so dangerous. Because when we start to add, to be a Christian, you must, we have immediately taken it out of God's hands. And whatever else you may believe about John Calvin, he got this piece right, that we cannot save ourselves. Because we are complicit in sin, because sin has control of our lives until salvation, there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. And that's why this is so dangerous and why Paul is so angry. Because he sees these people who have been given this grace being trapped back into self-salvation. We call it work salvation today. You know, even all the tech we have cannot give us eternal life. Think about that. God has done everything necessary. That's from Luther. Grace, faith, transformation into God's kingdom, everything. There's a little book of essays out there. Uh, It's recent. Maybe this year, last year it was published. It's called Quid Without Any Quo. Um, You've heard the term quid. Quid pro, <laughs> quid pro quo, something for something. I do something for you, you do something for me. Uh, politically, it's been, it's been in the political news for years now. Uh, this is quid without a quo. Grace is completely free. Completely free. And he follows Dorothy Sayers, who says, it's not as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ you must do these things, or as a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, you must not do these things, the religion I grew up with. These are two of the great sins among others, because once again they take salvation out of God's hands. See, none of this that you must do or must not do requires the shed blood of Jesus Christ to be a coherent message And that is what is required, that Jesus gave himself for our sins to free us from the power of sin through the will of God the Father. It is always that we are saved by grace through faith. Or if you want a slightly more technical statement, justification is by faith alone, through grace alone, to the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Holy God, straighten out our minds and by your grace free us from sin and draw us into your kingdom now and always. Amen. Again, if you are able, let's stand and we will sing together.
485, to God be the glory. Please be seated. And now let us pray. Holy God, we stand and look with wonder at what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. We look with wonder on this remarkable world which you have created and given to us. We look with wonder on the complexity and marvel of life. And we find it remarkable that you give us new life in Jesus Christ. We find, O oh Lord, that too often we would take this remarkable life into our own hands and form and create a life different from that which you intended. Rather, let us hear these words from Paul and from the gospel and even from the ancient book, the Old Testament, that tell us that you have done everything and you have given it all to us. That we will be renewed in Christ. That we will find this shalom, peace and joy, which the Old Testament preaches. And it is ours. It is free. It is a gift of grace, which you give us. And then let us learn to live with joy in this time and space and kingdom, which you give us. Let us, Lord, then be able to give you the glory that you deserve as best we can. Holy God, we pray for this world which is under the influence of evil, which brings us war and disease and poverty and trauma. But let us first go to this world 
and say grace and peace to you. Did you know that you can be free from this? Strengthen us, Lord, to be faithful and to reform our church and churches that we might be witnesses to this amazing grace which flows through us. That we might be lights to our friends, to our family, to our co-workers, to the people with whom we shop and share meals, to all. Let us, Lord, simply be your people by your grace. Praying this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if the ushers would come forward, please.
Now, if you would turn to page six, uh, we'll sing together. We have a story to tell to the nations. <laughs> bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.